For more than a century, the Eastman Kodak Company has been part of our lives, our memories, and our future. Continually pioneering technologies that make the process of taking pictures easier and the results remarkably better. Allowing us all to share the precious moments we treasure, the benchmarks of our lives with those we love. In fact, many of us fondly refer to those special times as Kodak moments. Gets you misty, doesn't it? Yep, they shoveled on the schmaltz pretty thick, didn't they? But that kind of crap doesn't work anymore. People want the latest digital things. More power, more features, wireless contraptions, innovative ways to bring their pictures into the 21st century. Well, guess what, bucko? Kodak is doing it. You thought they were just hiding out, waiting for this digital thing to blow over, didn't you? Oh, sure, for a while they were like, oh, there's no way digital's gonna catch on. Hell, 20 years ago, they pawned the first digital camera off on Apple. But now, Kodak is back. They're taking this digital thing to a level undreamed of. Pioneering technology that'll redefine the digital revolution. I know, big talk coming from the company that unleashed Advantix onto the world, right? Well, turn down your mini-disc player, fire up your Newtons, and listen up, because they're not playing grab-ass anymore. They've got things in their research labs that'll make biometrics look like a Happy Meal toy. I'm talking facial recognition, GPS-enabled photography so my camera knows where it is, pictures that learn and group themselves into stories. We're talking meta-knowledge. Cameras that automatically enhance the color of the grass because they know it's grass. Try and patent that. Oh, too late. <laughs> and what about sharing? I'll tell you about sharing. All your friends and family will be emailing their pictures wirelessly to you and sending pictures of grandma's birthday to your phone and uploading shots of the dog wearing those big stupid sunglasses to your PDA. And they're going to be everywhere because now you won't have to be a Navajo code breaker to use digital. And they're all going to look like freaking Eddie Leibowitz shot them because they'll automatically adjust the lighting and the composition for you. No more flash problems, no more red eye. How's that for advanced? Booyah! You know what the best part is? They're gonna turn the schmaltz back up to 11. Oh, yes. People will have their Kodak moments again. They're gonna bring back all those damn pictures of the cute puppies and the cuddly kittens and the cooing babies and that, that doe-eyed kid. You know the one. They're bringing them all back, all in the same spot. And it's gonna be 15 minutes long. And James Cameron will direct it. And Celine Dion will sing the theme song while riding along on a unicorn through a field of baby animals under a big blue sky. And there's not a damn thing you can do to stop it. You were a Kodak moment once. And by God, you'll be one again. Only this time, it's digital. Oh, yeah! All right, good afternoon. So good to see you guys here today. First of all, a shout out to my Kodak friends. Melody, I don't know where you guys are at, and Tom and Norm, I know you're, oh, well, they've heard this before, so they said get the hell out of here and hit the beach. I can understand that. Well, it's good to see you guys. Give me an amen for marketing, will you? Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, that sucked. Let's just say that was terrible. When I ask you for an amen, I want to hear like a revolution amen. I want to hear... I mean, you guys sound like a bunch of Lutherans. I mean, <laughs> Lutherans live in constant fear that someplace, sometime, somewhere, someone's having a good time. All right? So when I ask you for an amen, pretend like you're a Baptist. If you happen to be a, I don't know, Goldstein or something like that, throw in an oive. I don't care. All right? So give me an amen for marketing. Amen. That's it, brothers and sisters. I feel it. I feel it. I feel a feeling coming over the audience. I think we're going to have a revival here as long as we're going to have a revolution. Now, I'm from South Dakota. Anyone here from South Dakota? Where are you from? Where? So where in Sioux Falls? I, I have a house there, too. Okay. My sister's here. This is awesome. Actually, normally I say, well, is anyone here from South Dakota? And, and, and no one raises their hand. I mean, that's usually the way it is. This is what we call population density right here in this room from our state. No, I'm not, I'm not shitting you. You'd be like the seventh largest city in South Dakota. Just like, 
By the way, if you thought this was uh, going to be some kind of neat corporate presentation where you can kiss that shit goodbye right off the bat. <laughs> now, I said I was from South Dakota. My wife's from South Dakota. First time I met my wife's great-grandmother. Now, she's a tiny, very petite woman. My wife is only about five foot one, about 105 pounds. And, of course, you know, I'm six foot two, 200, or six three, and 280-some pounds. And, and Grandma Agnes, as I said, was smaller than Tammy. And first time I met her... Uh, Grandma Agnes looked at Tammy, and she looked way up at me, and she looked at Tammy, and she looked way up at me, and she turned back to Tammy and said, isn't he bigger than necessary? <laughs> okay? Yeah, so that's what I feel like at the end of the day, uh, kind of a deal. But let me talk to you a little bit about, about change, about revolution. You're going to hear some things today. I'll talk about the change that we had at Kodak. How many of you have bought a roll of film in the last year? Raise your hands. Man, it's not that funny, guy. I mean, it's... it's <laughs> I think you're really pissing me off over there. I really work for some. I saw two hands go up. Uh, three. Oh, three. Thank you, sir. You really helped make our quarter. I appreciate that. <laughs> Put us right over the top. Um, how many of you own a digital camera on your phone or a digital camera? Raise your hands. Okay, welcome to my world. Imagine what it was like stepping into this company five years ago. We were doing $15 billion. $15 billion in consumer film. This year, Kodak will do less than $200 million in consumer film. You think you got a tough marketing problem? <laughs> For us, it was adapt or die. It was like, you know, a proof of life. We basically, like most of us learn in Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts, when we came across a body that's laying on the ground, you take a mirror, you hold it up to its mouth and see whether it's breathing. Does it fog the mirror? In fact, in marketing, I think that's a lot of what we need to do because Whereas we're going through this revolution, we're learning the different tools that we get from a Primo and other vendors and other partners. We're finding out different ways that we can do things. And as we find out the ways in which we do it, we have to hold mirrors to their mouth. We have to see, you know, why we're in this game. We really have to examine what we're doing with the ways we're doing it in different ways than we've ever done before. Now, when I asked people at Kodak what kind of company we were, they would say, well, we're a film company. I go, no, we're not. <laughs> You know, they said, well, we're in the consumer inkjet business now, so we're an inkjet company. No, we're not. They were very passionate about the things that we were, and I'll get to about what we were, but it wasn't those things. In fact, I was so passionate about pheasants a number of years ago back in South Dakota, I went out and started a pheasant farming operation. I love pheasants, folks. I love to watch them, you know. I love to see them. I love to hunt them. I love to kill them, and I love to eat them, okay? I love pheasants. And and I was so passionate, I went out and got like, you know, 10,000 acres, and I put up pens all over this place. I, I pens the size of this room, the size of football fields, and I put telephone poles around them, and, and I strung nets over the top so that the pheasants could run around free before I killed them, you know? And so <laughs> one night as it would happen in South Dakota, the thunderstorm rolled across the prairie in big, huge, torrential rain. And, and um, as, as I did that, um, 10,000 birds looked up into the sky, opened their beaks, and drowned. Oh, yeah. These are the dumbest birds on the face of the freaking earth. There's a reason why they call birds fowl and pheasants are it. You know what it's like? Oh, go ahead and laugh now. It's a lot of therapy later, you know, lose a lot of money. I mean, what? Zero wasn't your money. It was my money. I mean, I tried to corner the market on pheasants until I realized there wasn't one, right? Now I have a saying in business. You hire a turkey, you train a turkey, you motivate a turkey, you have a? No, you have a pheasant. Please stay with me. This is a slow audience this afternoon. Stay with me as much as you possibly can. Now, one of the other things as a chief marketing officer of a Fortune 100 company, I was, had a lot of vendors come and talk to me. You have that in your part of the line of the work, right? Yeah, we all do. And I tell you, they were coming to me and talking to me, and I learned out that this elevator pitch that they were giving me turned out to be what I called a 30-page PowerPoint presentation. I mean, it's supposed to be an elevator pitch. Now, it's supposed to be something you do in the span of an elevator ride, isn't that right? And maybe you guys live in taller places than <laughs> South Dakota, the tallest building in the whole state's what? Downtown Holiday Inn. Yeah, it's nine stories, you know? Whole, that's the biggest building in our entire state. It has one of those rotating ballrooms. Remember that? It doesn't work anymore, but it used to, you know? And it was really cool because you used to take your date to that. Remember that? You take your date to her, you know? It was really cool. The fancy place, rotating ballroom. Except when you went to the bathroom and came back, she'd moved on you, right? So 
But these 30-page PowerPoint presentations, and at the end of an hour, I said, I didn't know what the hell these people were doing. So I decided to change it. It's been one of the biggest concepts in my book, The Mirror Test. I call it the 118. Here is what it is. This is the new Elevator, elevator Pitch 2.0, the new digital version. It's called the 118. Eight seconds is the average attention span of an adult. It is. I know it to be true. I looked it up on the internet. Okay? 110 seconds is the average elevator ride in New York City. From the time you press the button, wait for the doors to open, step on, ride up or ride down and get off. Folks, that's what you have. You have 118 seconds. You have eight seconds to hook me, 110 seconds to close me. That's what you have. Define it in that time. In fact, in your business, how many of you can define what your 118 is? More importantly, can every single one of your marketing team do the exact same 118? More importantly, can every single person in your company give that same elevator pitch or the 118? By the way, you have to get it to at least 118 seconds or less. But if Moses can do it in less than two tablets of five bullet points each, you can do it in a lot less time, okay? I don't care where you were or from, that was funny, all right? <laughs> That was, a, I practiced that line, the guys backstage thought it was hilarious. The Fab Four, I've been back to the guys at the Fab Four, what a great show. I've been back there playing with their guitars and everything, I hope they didn't mind, I moved all those little things on their end of the thing. <laughs> I think they're gonna sound great, you know, it should be good. They, 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 they just go around saying, hey, we all live in a yellow submarine. I think they've been smoking something, personally, but. Oh, come on, and lighten up, folks. I know it's the end of the day, but geez, come on. Now, let's see if this ever happened to you. This is about leadership. Second mirror test, looking in the mirror and saying, do I have what it takes to run the operation? Now, let's say you pull up to McDonald's. You pull up to McDonald's, you get up to the first speaker, and you shout your order. You pull up to the first window, you pay your money. You pull up to the second window, you're expecting to get your food. What happens? Person leans out the window and says, I'm sure, sir, 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 it's not quite ready. If you don't mind pulling up to this little parking space, we'll bring it right out to you. Has that ever happened? Absolutely. Do what I do and say, no, thank you, I'll wait. And I roll my window back up. <laughs> oh, yeah. Pretty soon, the 14-year-old assistant manager comes over and knocks on my window. <laughs> said, sir, is there a problem? I said, there's no problem. He says, we're going to hold people up. I go, I don't mind. And I roll my window back up. <laughs> Soon, the 16-year-old manager comes over and knocks on my window. Said, sir, is there an issue? I said, yeah, there is. See, we had conditions of satisfaction. I gave you my order. You took it. I gave you my money. You took it. I'm expecting to get my food. I'm not getting it, so I'm not taking it. You're asking me to pull over here to parking purgatory, but you're not giving me a thing in return. I mean, how about one of those McMinty shakes or one of those apple pies I like? You know, change the deal. Until then, I don't mind waiting, and I'll hold everybody up, and I roll my window back up. Now when I go, you like that. That was good. I like that. I like a woman who can laugh like that. My wife does that every night. And, and so... Okay, now you got that one. I think that was, I think I know this crowd at this point. So, so now when I go to McDonald's, I pull up to the speaker, I shout out my order, I pull up to the first one, I pay my money, I pull up to the second one, and my food is thrown through the window into my car. It's about setting conditions of satisfaction in our business. Folks, I will tell you, I spend more time in this area with my marketing teams or with the people I work with, my vendors, my customers, especially my customers who happen to be my boss at the time, CEO of Kodak, and I would sit down and say, okay, what promises do you need me to deliver? What are the things that I have to deliver? What are our conditions of satisfaction? What time frame? What's my budget? All those kind of things. Work those out ahead of time. I spend a lot of time on that before I go out and start doing things. It saves a lot of time. How many of you are spending time talking about conditions of satisfaction? Now, the other thing I think that marketers are supposed to do in the organization, especially leaders are supposed to be doing in the organization, is cause tension. In fact, that was my job at Kodak, was to cause tension. I did a pretty good job. My job is to take everybody from the center of the table and move them to the edge of the table. From the center of the stage, move to the edge of the stage. That's our job as leaders. Now, HR and legal, those guys, will want to pull you all the way to the back, back to the center, and you have to tell them that's not their job. Their job is to keep you from falling off. That's their job. There's a saying in sports, no pain, no. Why don't we have tension in business? This is our version of pain. Healthy tension's a good thing. 
having differences of opinions amongst teams are good things, amongst individuals, amongst the businesses, amongst the silos, amongst the functions. Those are good things to have because what happens is you get a better product as a result. When I first brought the team together at Kodak, when I first stepped in there five years ago, I had 800 and some marketers pulled into a room and I said, let me tell you a story. And I told them a story about a book from, about a story from the book, The Goal. I don't know if you've ever read it, but if you haven't, you should. You should. It's a really good book. In there, the author talks about taking a group of Cub Scouts on a hike. As he took these kids up on a hike up a mountain, the kids got separated. Some of the kids were faster than some of the other kids. And so, as the adult, as the leader, he thought he should stay with the slow kids while the fast kids went up ahead because he was afraid if something would happen, if something would happen to the fast kids, at least he would catch up. But throughout the entire hike, he was worried about how could he put them together? How could he keep them together? He got to the first rest area. The fast kids had already rested. They got up and moved on. He was still with the slow kids. He was thinking, if I rearrange them, if I move here and move here until finally he dined on them, he could only move as fast as his slowest common denominator. I looked out at my team much like this, and I said, some of you are slow common denominators. My job is to take you on that trick, to take you on that hike, to move us in a fast. In fact, that was our slogan at the time, fast. Focus, accountability, simplicity, and trust. Our kind of headline was, even if we screw up, let's just do it faster. Okay? <laughs> Causing tension. So I turned to the group and said, some of you are the slowest common denominators and I'm going to find you. I'm going to hunt you down, and I'm going to ask you to leave the company. We love you, but we're going to miss you. How many of you have slow combo denominators on your team today? Whether they be vendors or customers or even people that work for you. And what are you doing to move them out of your team? And as you start making all these changes, as we did, as we were fast, we became faster and then fastest, so to speak. As we made those changes, you're going to make mistakes. And people would come to me and say, Jeff, what happens if we make a mistake with the campaign or we do something wrong? Here was my one answer. Is anyone going to die? <laughs> well, we're going to do this big mailing. We're going to spend this. We're going to do that. Is anyone going to die? And that was my motto. In fact, we were in this huge campaign against Big Inc. And my apologies to Big Inc. if you're in this room, but I'm sorry. I just have to point it out. Big Inc., imagine this. This is a fight. I'm not allowed to tell you who they are because the lawyers and the attorneys, they follow me around everywhere. And so we're in this huge fight with Big Inc. You've got to imagine the model. We're going to enter into the inkjet model and into the market against a competitor that made $9 billion off of inkjet cartridges last year. $9 billion just off a of profit from ink. Big ink. That's what I call them. The model is you get a printer for free basically off the shelf, but they charge you like 60 bucks for the inkjet cartridges, and they're locked up behind the counter. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> now, we all think that oil's pretty freaking expensive. I mean, um, you know, imagine that. I mean, oil. And you know what's more expensive than oil? It's right there on your table. Bottled water, that's exactly right. More expensive than oil. You know what's more expensive than bottled water? You're going to have it later. No, vodka. Vodka, yes. <laughs> but nice, nice going. He jumped out there real quick with that wine thing, didn't he? And what's more expensive than vodka if you had a pretty good year? Champagne. Okay, champagne. More expensive. If you have too much vodka and champagne, what's more expensive than that? Penicillin. Okay, life-saving life penicillin. <laughs> And more expensive than all of those combined by a factor of 10 is ink in those stupid little ink cartridges. <laughs> when you were paying four bucks a gallon for ink, or excuse me, four bucks a gallon for gas, remember that? And you had a 20 gallon tank and you filled it up as 80 bucks, you're going, oh, I am pissed off, I'm outraged. <laughs> Do you know what it would cost you to fill up your tank with ink from big ink? <laughs> Come on. Anybody want to guess? 300,000, not even close. Now, the model is we're only going to charge you a fair price for the printer, and Kodak says we're going to charge you half price for the ink. That's what our model is. They're charging you basically a free printer and gouge you for the ink, kind of like a crack pipe and a crack kind of thing. <laughs> That's what I've heard. 
I don't want to say that that's what they're doing, just what I've heard. You someone guessed a thousand. You know what it would cost you to fill up your gas tank? $462,000 is what it would cost you to fill up your tank with black ink from big ink. Now, at Kodak, we were only going to charge you half of that because we care, all right? So I'm in this big fight with Big Ink. I'll just give you their initials, HP. So, so don't want to get sued. Now, so in this fight, and I said, how about we go out and do some campaign to show the decadence of this model? And I said, what do we do? So I came, we came up, we started brainstorming. There's a group like this, we started brainstorming. Someone said, let's hire someone for The Sopranos. We do kind of a gangster thing. I said, it's great. So we hired Vinny Pastore, the guy that played Big Pussy. You remember him? <laughs> Even if we didn't, I just wanted to say Big Pussy up on the stage. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, I remember one time I used the F word on stage. Oh, that's not, it wasn't good. No, I, I thought it was good. I was at a, the ad tech. You guys have been to ad tech, right? If you can use the F word anywhere in the world, it would be at an internet conference in San Francisco, right? Okay, well, imagine you get the call from your chairman after you've used it. And I remember getting called to his office, and he said, you can't use the F word on stage, Jeff. You're one of the top three officers in the company of a Fortune 100 company. It's not appropriate. I said, boss, you told me to push the line. You told me to stretch it. He goes, but I didn't tell you to cross it. <laughs> and I said, well, now we know where it's at, right? I and mean, we know where it's at. So no one's going to die. So anyway, <laughs> now. So this is revolution. This is what it's all about. It's about stretching, about pushing, no pain, no gain. Now, I, we hired Vinny Pastore. Imagine the scene. A, a rainy day, foggy. He pulls up in a black Cadillac next to the East River. He gets out, slams his door. He's carrying a baseball bat. He walks to the back of the car. He opens the trunk, and you hear it creak open. And you see a scene what you think is a body laying in the trunk, looking up at Vinny, bent over with the baseball bat, saying, you've been lying to us. You've been cheating us. You've been robbing us blind. The family says, you got to go. And then we show a picture of an HP inkjet printer in the deck. <laughs> Next scene, on the ground, beats it with a baseball bat, puts a chain around it, cement block, throws it in the East River. He gets into the caddy puts his arm around a Kodak inkjet printer and says, welcome to the family. And then it says, don't get whacked by high inkjet prices, text such and such, coupon off, and we run a mobile campaign. I said, this is great. We tested double digit, double digit response on this mobile campaign. This is awesome. It's going to be great. I said, sign up for a blockbuster weekend. We'll put it in motion pictures everywhere. Double down, let's go, let's make it happen. Team came, said double digit response, this is great. It goes in on the summer weekend, blockbuster. Huge weekend opening for movies. Our thing is being seen by everywhere. I come back in the office on Monday morning, I sit down at my desk, two people walk in. They've got a sheet of paper with all the numbers, all the stats of the numbers of texts that we got over the weekend. I get the sheet of paper and I look at it, and on the sheet, is written the number two. Yeah, two. I said, is this two million? <laughs> no. 200,000? No. 20,000? No. No, Jeff, it's two. I said, get everybody in a room right now. The team comes together. I said, someone please explain to me what happened. I said, you guys sh tested it. It was double digit, double digit response. People thought it was hilarious. It was funny. It was good. People were texting us back and all the testing. Someone please explain to me what the hell went wrong with this campaign. Finally, someone in the back of the room raised their hand. I said, what? He goes, Jeff, what do you do when you sit in a motion picture theater with your phone? I said, where the hell were you when we came up with this idea? I turned back to the team and I said, what? No one's going to die. We blew it on that one. How do we repurpose it? We repurposed it to a different type of campaign. It became a very successful one. In fact, that product's grown at about 160% this year over last year. So not a bad move. 
No one's going to die. Keep that mantra going as you think about it. Imagine this company five years ago. 70%, 80% of the business at the time was traditional business. Now, 70, 80%, close to 85% before the end of this year will be a digital business. Digital business. New revenue. In fact, most of you know Kodak is a consumer company, yet the company today is 80% of the company is B2B. Massive change. At the same time, 60% of the people that are at the company are new within the last five years. 60%. 19 products drive almost 80% of the revenue. Of that, all the products in those categories are number one, number two, or number three. Every single one. Number one, number two, or number three. Market share in every product. And half of those products didn't exist two years ago. Massive change. 40% of all commercially printed documents in the world touch with Kodak technology. Weren't in that business five years ago, now number one worldwide. Over 75 million people participate and store their photos, their Kodak moments, high resolution photos with Kodak. Over 5 billion photos are stored on the Kodak gallery alone. More high resolution photos are stored on the Kodak gallery than all of the other sites in the world combined. Did you know that? Yeah, take that, Facebook. So. <laughs> These are people that pay us money, not just come and visit. So now, how do we do it? Oh, come on. You guys know about getting paid, right? It's cool. That's what we're here for. I find companies, when they do very well, is when they really get back to their core. And at Kodak, we lost our way. See, we thought we were in the film business when we weren't. We're in the material science and imaging science business. That's primarily what we did. We used to grow our own cattle. Grow our own cattle, melt down, and slaughter the cattle first, then melt down the bones to make gelatin, squeeze them through tiny little tubes into microscopic drops that would filter down and layer themselves against 21 different layers to form that thin little layer called film, and we did it in the dark. Has anyone ever been to Rochester, New York? A few of you? Then you know what I'm talking about. It is so cold in Rochester, we got nothing better to do but invent shit, okay? <laughs> no, we have over 35,000 patents. Only four companies have more patents than we do. Material science and imaging science. I mean, every single camera that's used today has Kodak technology, even if you buy someone else's. I do encourage you, I'm not with Kodak anymore, I do encourage you to buy a Kodak camera, though. It's true. We put a slimming feature into every single one. <laughs> Seriously, all the other cameras make you look fat. It's a new slogan, right? Come on, people. Back there, that was funny as well. And you guys, you guys aren't even trying to make eye contact with me. It really kind of. So, folks, when I started asking the employees what we do, what we do, what we do, what is your DNA? What's your 118? For our company, what was it? We lost our way. People would say, well, we're a film company. No, we're not. We're an imaging company. No, we're not. Well, we're an inkjet company. No, we're not. We're a commercial print company because we're number one in that. No, we're not. Well, we're number one in cameras. Well, yes, but we're not a camera company. See, we had the only product that people would actually run into a burning building to save. That's at the core of who we were. So for us, I called it M3I squared. See, we make, we manage, we move images and information. We do that in your personal life or in your business. See, we make the emotional technology that goes into every single one of those products. That's the business we're in. And that's different than saying we're in the inkjet business or the film business, because those businesses will eventually go away, and what's our future? And at the same time we started to make these changes and understand fundamentally who we were, we said we had to go through a brand transformation. Folks, I was so excited to go to work for Kodak, I could not wait to get there. I was just ecstatic about going. In fact, I showed up a week early before I passed the urine test or anything. I went, got on a plane, flew to, Co flew to Kodak in Rochester. I'm sitting on a plane next to this like 26, 27-year-old gal, and I'm trying to get her to ask me what I do because I want to tell her, you know? Well, I'm pretty excited. I mean, you know, so it's kind of cool. And, and so she, we start talking, and she starts talking about herself, going on about her, yada, 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 like, I want to hear any of that, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Finally, she takes a break and says, well, what do you do? I said, well, I'm the chief marketing officer for Eastman Kodak. And she said, who's that? 
True story. I went, crap, this is going to be a lot tougher than I thought. <laughs> so I started thinking about, oh, how are we going to do it? What are we going to do differently? How are we going to make the changes? So we started thinking about the old versus new and how you make changes in the way in which we do things and start bringing back some of those things. That we had the highest things on trust, but we had to stretch it. So we started saying, look, do something different. That white page you see up there is our website about two years ago. That was our website two years ago. It looks nice. It's still attractive. I mean, it's got the picture of the day. We all know a picture's worth a thousand words. In fact, that's the name of our blog, a thousandwords.com. We also love our scientists and the people that make our product. We call that a thousandnerds.com. That's their blog. But look at that. It's got the picture of the day. It's got everything up there. It's great. Syndicated out. But look at it. It looks like a freaking yard sale. It's got this section and this section and this section and this section. See, what happens is, oh, all the teams come to you and start saying, oh, I'm 50% of the profit. I'm 35% of the sales. I'm this, I'm that. You hear that crap? Huh? Tell them to stop it, okay? Because I said, look, but picture's worth a thousand words. How about we change it a little bit and we make something that put a stake in the ground? We have to put a stake in the ground, just like when we built a printer. We built this printer the size of this stage. We're going to launch it at Drupa, big, huge trade show. We're going to launch this. It's, it's, it's like this tall. It's from that wall to right over here to this wall. We sell it for $4 million. It's the world's fastest printer, inkjet printer, 4,000 pages per minute, variable text, variable information, glossy coated stock, everything. The team brings it to me and says, this is it. And they basically show me the design and said, this is what you're going to announce in a couple of months, Jeff, and we want to make sure you're okay with it. And I said, no, you're not. You're not announcing that. And they go, why? I mean, it was, it was gray, rectangular box. I mean, looked like a semi-trailer. It looked like, like something Soviet shot putters had designed. <laughs> and I said, we're not doing it. And they said, why? I said, Can, are you kidding me? I said, when the chairman and I stand up at the press conference and we unveil the thing in front of 8,000 people that are in the press conference room at the time, I said, I want people to look at it and go, oh, oh. I want them to run up to it, stand next to it, have their pictures taken. I said, it should look like a Maserati. It's the world's fastest printer in the world. It should look like a Ferrari, a Maserati. It should look like fires coming out of its ass as it's sitting there on the showroom floor. I said, there's no way. I mean, you got to do something different. I said, so take it back. And they said, we only have two months before we announce it. I said, I don't care. You're not announcing it. You have to change it. So two weeks they came back, <laughs> they rounded the corners. <laughs> Made it two-tone. Put a racing stripe down the side. <laughs> Looked like something the Czechoslovakians would have designed, but it was better, all right? And we have to do that from time to time. So I went to our team and said, look, if a picture's worth a thousand words, that's all we're putting on our website. And we put the product information, you have landing pages and everything else. And that's what we did. We drove 117 million people a day. I went to the White House photographer the day of the inauguration. Actually, a little bit ahead of time, said, look, the day of the inauguration, give me five photographs. Nobody else sees the day before anybody else sees them. Let us have it. And right there in that little screen right there, right, right there, you can click on it, and the photographer tells you in a 1,000 words or less why that's a Kodak moment. My predecessor had actually let the words, the trademark Kodak moment expire, and we brought it back. During the best pictures, like last night, we take the best pictures from the Oscar because 98% of all motion pictures are done in Kodak technology, and we do it that way. And we drive it, and we make it happen. So changing it. Then you've got to have some fun. This happens to be our website last April when we announced the iCamera on April 1st of last year. Okay, for those of you laughing, explain to the people next to you that aren't. It has the facial recall assistant, which is handy for parties and reunions. <laughs> this one is good, the image stabilizer, which is auto-enabled at happy hour. <laughs> the wink and shoot shutter, I like that one. X-ray vision coming soon, right there. <laughs> this year we announced aromatography. Yes, photography you can smell. Imagine the photographs, a big picture of flowers with this big, huge sniff here button right there. Big yellow and red, sniff here. And, my, and then I had a wet dog shaking, you know. And my favorite one was a baby with a diaper crawling away. I got over 3,000 emails that day going, your product is defective. I put my nose up to the screen and I couldn't <laughs> smell anything. I captured all those names and sent those over to Big Ink as leads for them. <laughs> what you got to do. So, now, 
I've only got a couple minutes, so I'm just going to keep moving because I'm on, I'm on, I'm a high on caffeine right now. I'm going like crazy. They gave me four Diet Mountain Dews backstage. <laughs> Not really. Now, for those of you who get about getting engaged, now everybody's learning, listening. Listening, I like this term, listening. We're all listening now. What the hell were you doing before, right? We're all listening. In fact, I put in the very first chief listening officer ever. Oh, someone said, oh, that's a big press release. I said, no, I need somebody to act like an air traffic controller, watch the conversations that are going online. When someone starts to say something about us, I want to know. I want to put that over to product you know, categories. I want to put it product development. I want to put this one over to customer service because they're bitching and moaning. I want to put this one over to sales because of a potential sales opportunity. So one of the four E's is about getting engaged. When someone writes, F you and your F in products, Kodak, go F yourself. Now, I abbreviated for you. Now, when someone writes that, I want to know that that's going on. I kind of want to engage with the person, get in a conversation. And we got to that person, turned them around. It was one of our employees. We got them back in. <laughs> you know? And so what you want to have, have, have happen is then they start to educate. They start telling you things. Like, this is a really cool product. Someone said, this is an HD pocket video camera codec put together. And it's got a microphone jack on it right there. And then how we got the microphone jack is someone tweeted and said, if you add a microphone jack to this product, I'll buy it. And I saw it, and I went to the team, and I said to the team, can you add a microphone jack? And they said, yeah, we can add it. I said, how much would it cost? They told me. I said, how fast could you put it? And they said they, they could get it in the next iteration. I said, let's do it. And they said, don't you want to test it? I go, no. They go, what happens if we make a mistake? No one's going to die. Outsell the competitor 10 to 1 because of that little, tiny, little piece right there. And then what happens is you start to engage, and you start educating each other, and you start getting excited. When you get excited, you start to evangelize. And so people start to become brand ambassadors for you. And that's what we have to do. See, the last point on this thing is it's, this is a game not about eyeballs and ears. It's about hearts and minds. For those of you swinging for the fences on these viral videos, stop. Stop. It's a waste of time. If they happen to go viral, great. That's fun. But really, this is about building a community. As fast as they come to you is as fast as they'll leave you. So my encouragement to you is about get engaged. Build a community. And then you're going to have a lot of people come to you and talk about the return on investment, that ROI word, right? And you've got great tools with a Primo that will be able to help you with that. But when it doesn't work, I always tell people when they come to me, they used to come to me and say, Jeff, all this social media, what's your return on investment? I said, I don't know. You tell me what the return on ignoring is. I'll tell you what the return on investment is. And that's what we have to do. This isn't a game whether we get to choose whether we're going to do this or not. It's here. This is the new way of doing it, and it, it's a big change from the way that we looked at it. And then some of you say you can't sell products with this kind of thing, and I'm here to tell you you can't. When we launched the, when we launched the uh, ZI-8 at the time, in fact, there's an article right there the Boston Globe wrote that said one of the three greatest products I've ever seen, this HD pocket video, 10 hours of video, uh, 720, 1080p, 5 megapixels still. Oh, well, hang, hang on. This is a glass of water. It's a Florida water. It's more than a liquid. It's a meal, you know. <laughs> oh, come on, people. That just kills them in Sioux City, Iowa. Now, so when we launched, they said the three greatest products they've ever seen, the iPhone, the, iPhone, the Android, and the ZI8, but what marketing genius came up with the name? I said, you're absolutely right. I pulled the team together, as I normally do with a room, and I reacted. I said, hey, what's going on? Tell me about the new product. And they showed it to me. This was it. I said, this is, this is awesome. I said, tell me more about this HD Pocket video camera. I said, what's so much special about this? I said, it's just a different design. They go, no, Jeff, it is different. I said, how different? They said, well, it's waterproof. I said, a waterproof video camera? Who makes a waterproof video camera? I mean, who makes one of these things? I said, anybody else? They go, no. I said, that's fabulous. I said, that's fabulous. I said, what are we going to call it? And they said, the ZX3. I said, ZX3, you got to be freaking kidding me. We're not now in ZX3. Before we get out of this room, we're going to come up with a different name. And someone said, how about we do a, a Twitter contest? We tweet it. We crowdsource it. No one's done that yet. And I said, fabulous idea. Let's do it. Let's tweet it. What are we going to give as a prize? They said, how about we bring them to CES for a week, and we'll name them the mother or the father of the product, OK? That'll be cool, Jeff. And then you'll bring them to the press conference, and you'll put your arm around them and do all that kind of stuff. And then uh, you'll take them with you on the Today Show with you and Al Roker doing the candy bar and a whole bit, and it'll be awesome, and you'll do that. And, Jeff, why don't we put a picture of them, of the mother or the father of the product, on the box or in the box, depending on what they look like, right? <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, you know, come on, we're marketers, not like social workers. So, so I said, that's awesome. I said, let's tweet it out. Let's do it. And they go, whoa, 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 we can't do that yet. And I go, why? And they said, well, we have to run it by legal first. Oh, those sneaky bastards. So I said, okay, why? And they said, well, we have a contest person. I go, what? They go, we have a contest person. He's got to prove the contest. I said, we have a contest person? I said, we run like three or four contests a year. What are we going to do? Add another one? Ooh, workload. I mean, come on. <laughs> I said, how much, how, much, how much is it going to cost us for that? And they said, well, oh, I, you know, we don't know. I said, well, let's imagine it's a $50,000 fine. I said, it's worth it. I said, we'll get a press release out of it. Even though I get in trouble, we'll get a press release out of it. It'll be great. And we're fighting for the people. I said... Uh, and I said, we're not going to pay this firm over here a quarter of a million dollars to come up with a ZX3 name, so we'll save that money. Not that that's the reason why we're doing it. I said, let it go. So in a matter of days, we, we, we sent it out. By the way, from the time in which we came up with the idea, from the time in which we sent the tweet, was 26 hours. Okay? In a matter of four days, because that's all we had, because we had to get back to legal to get the clearances on the name, packaging and everything else, get it over to overseas to start getting it all done. We had thousands and 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 thousands. 28,000 names were submitted in less than four days. More people came to our website and commented on our website during those four days than the entire history of the website to date. 28,000 names. My favorite name? Pocket Rocket. Unfortunately, I couldn't call it that because that would have been a three-day HR seminar. <laughs> Most of you know. The name that we came up with was the Kodak Play Sport. We have the Play Touch now, the Play Sport. Can you go back to the slide for me for a second? Because I want to show you. Those are the two guys that named it. One was Mr. Play, one was named Mr. Sport. Needless to say, their pictures are in the box. Let's just say they got great personalities. Nice guys. <laughs> nice guys. So, creative people should never have to compromise on what you sell and how you sell it. Your job is to create tension. Your job is to cause a revolution. Your job is to push it beyond you've never pushed it before because no one's going to die. So what is your 118? What is the way in which you tell your story? How do you tell your story? How do you weave it so that people want to join your community and be a part of it? Think about how you do that. We knew at Kodak that people don't just take pictures. They capture moments. They capture memories. That's why it's called a Kodak moment. That's why you all use it. That's why when you stand there at Christmas time or holiday time and you take two or three pictures, it's not because Billy's behind you doing like this behind someone's head. It's because you're trying to capture the emotion that's in that photograph. And we know that it's important for you to be able to share those. That's why Kodak has now started to put a share button on every single camera. A share button. So you hit one button, it goes into the cloud, it goes to your account, it goes to our competitors. We don't care. We didn't care because it was about sharing. Because see, the chief memory officer in the family, she doesn't have enough time. And by the way, you can up to have up to 5,000 photos on one camera because she also never wants to delete or lose one of those, right? It's our memories that make me me. It's those memories that define me, separate me. It's when I share those that I become complete. Watch this video. My first cat. This is me and my dad right here. She lived to be 101. I really love my little brother, and we were always very close. When I think of her, I think of this cute little face that she makes when she scrunches up her nose, and then I got this invitation in the mail that reminds me exactly of that face that she makes. This is my mom, this is my dad, this is my little sister, Artie. Pictures of our uh, first date when we were 14 years old. Uh, we've been married for four years, about to start a family. I like this one because of the cake. This is a photograph of my mom and me on my first day of college. This picture has been sitting in the same frame on the same dresser for 11 years now. When I look at this, I feel like I'm still a little bit of that person. Er hat das Bild dann mit dem Krankenhaus dabei gehabt, es hat ihn die ganze Zeit über begleitet und ähm, 
Ich glaube, dass es ihm geholfen hat, schnell wieder gesund zu werden. I could be out in the backyard playing with the kids, snap a picture, come in and send it to them. Just want to let you know what the kids are doing right now. And they love it. They feel like, even though they're so far away, they're still part of our lives. They can see her grow every single day as we're sending out photos and videos and things to them. If I had to take one thing from my house, if my house is on fire, I would take all my pictures. So I think when we're in first place in these bike races, it's cool and I want to remember that. And I want to share that with my team, I want to share that with my family. I share over a thousand pictures on Facebook. I got a lot of comments because um, I'm the only person who caught a fish out of five guys. It just reminds me of how much fun they always had. And it's pretty meaningful to me because my mom passed away in February. So I look at it and think of her. Every time our parents took a picture, they made doubles, so we each have a copy of the picture. Yeah, it's definitely something we're going to be showing our kids someday, just to know where their parents started and how young we were and how it all worked out. This is a picture of four generations of my family. like I have my friends, my family right in front of me. It just sort of captured everything that I want to remember about that day. Oh, it just tells me that I have such a full life. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So I twisted Jeff's arm. Um, take a couple questions from the audience. Over there, right there. <laughs> oh, good. That's what we want. That's what it's intended to do. That was a video that was never shown outside the company. That was uh, that one and a couple of other ones were shown when I started to remake the brand, and I had to tell people, "This is what we do. This is what we do. We don't just make these products. This is what we do." And that's part of that 118. And you start to tell people that, that adds a whole new thing to your value, doesn't it? Big difference. Yes, ma'am. But why did you leave? Uh, my job was done. Um, you know, the average lifespan of most CMOs is like, you know, 18 months or 23 months now. Um, my, my, my first inclination was to stay there for 24 months. I did that. And uh, when I left the company, the company this last year, last quarter, is up 27%, $1.8 billion in the bank against the debt of $1.1 billion, and it's just, uh, it's rocking and it's rolling. My job was done. My job is a change agent. That's what I do. And uh, I have three criteria for the way I work. One is I have to build wealth for my family because we have to pay the bills. That's how we keep score. Two is I have to have fun. And three, I got to grow professionally. And so I was done. It was time for me to move. And so, um, and then I've, I've got some other things that are coming out in, in the future, and it was time to get those ready and get them moving. So, yeah, up front here. Yeah, I think in some ways you had it a little bit easier because it was change or die. Yeah. Companies who are kind of doing okay, but you know they can do a lot better. So how do you make that change happen so as quickly as you did? You said that, I, so there was a little, a little bit of an oxymoron, but uh, I get where you're coming from. So a lot of ways I had it easier because it was either change or die. It's not easy in any company of 27, 30, 40,000 employees who all believe with this legacy who've been there for 30, 40 years that this is the way to go. And any new people coming in, they didn't like any of it. I can tell you that right now. They didn't believe they were gonna die. They didn't believe they were gonna die. Hubris of success, if you read Jim uh, Collins' latest book, but they had hubris of success. I mean, we were at stages, there's six, six stages of decline. We were at stage five and a half. And there's only a few companies that have ever come back from that. IBM is one of those. Apple is one of those. Um, steel, uh, a big steel company, I can't remember. Um, but you can change that. The key thing for us, and we had to do this for the whole company, is I don't want you to underestimate it. Some people talk about culture. It's not about culture. It's about changing the mood. The first thing we had to do inside the company was change the mood of the company that our best days were ahead of us, not behind us. 
And that's not easy to do. And so you have to live it. I mean, guys, and, and, and you have to do it. I mean, I can come back in there, and people would say, I would walk into the operations of the office, and I'd say, look, we got customers coming in. Look at this carpet. It looks filthy. we got to clean it. And they say, well, we can't clean it because we don't have the money, and it's too expensive. I go, how much does it cost to clean the freaking carpets, you know? So they come back, and they tell me, for the four, it's $3,300. I said, well, that's too much money. That's ridiculous. <laughs> I said, that is, that's ridiculous. So I said, so Saturday morning, I got nothing better to do. I went down to Sears. I bought one of those steam cleaning machines, and I went up to my office, and I cleaned the entire floor's carpets. And I cleaned them all, okay? I, mean, I got no friends. I got nothing else to do. So, <laughs> and, by the way, but then I, but I also noticed that when I cleaned the carpets, this thing around the corner, all around the sideboards was marble. And I go, oh, come on. So I went over to the corner, and I ripped up in the hallway, and I found marble floors. I mean, can you believe we covered up marble floors with this beautiful green shag carpet? <laughs> and so the next Saturday, I got a group of team together, and we went up there, and guess what we did? Ripped up the carpets, got some buffers, and we buffed the floors. And so it's about setting examples and doing things. For companies who don't have that, do or die, but I'm telling you, even if it's do or die, we don't always see the things because we look in the mirror and we look at something different than what's really there. And that's why I wrote the mirror test, about taking the mirror test and look in the real mirror and ask yourself some very hard questions. And I don't care if you're doing extremely well in your Apple, because you can screw it up there too, called four, iPod, or phone, what was their version of their four phone, right? Huh? You can screw things up and still be at the top of your game. Or you can have things really bad for you and come back. So it's, it's, it's really tough all the way. It's always about people. And it's always about making products. I mean, I told the team, I said, when we started coming out with these products, I said, look. They said, well, we're going to make it this way. And I go, no, it's got to be this way. I've got to put a stake in the ground. It's got to have this. It's got to be slim. It's got to be able to fit in the pocket. It's got to have at least 10 hours of video. It's got to have 1080p. It's got to have a 720. You've got to put a mic jack on it. And they go, well, we can't do all that. And I said, look, you can't be cool and dress like Elmer Fudd. <laughs> and so that's how we'd start to tell people. And so you've got to really put stakes in the ground. And that's the job of marketing. That's the job of leaders, is to put a stake in the ground and say, that's what we're going to build, and that's what we're going to do, and you know, that's where we're going to go. Another question? One more. One more? Back over here, I see. And then I'm going to stick around for the thing afterwards, too. Were there people on the inside of Kodak that saw the need to change before it really had to be do or die? Yeah, there were. There were a lot of them. And, and, and I had to go find those people because they'd been beaten down. Beaten down. <laughs> it's like running the gauntlet. It's like... It's like, imagine inside of a company and you're the one that wants change and nobody can see it. It's like being captured, you're a trapper in 1823 and you've been captured by the Shoshone Indians, okay? And they're brought into the tribe and the tribe lines up two lines of people uh, a, a parallel from each other, five feet apart. Then they put you in the middle of that line and tell you that you have a chance to get free if you run down the gauntlet. And then they beat you and they stab you and they hit you and they kill you. And then when you get free, they say, you can go, but we're going to get on horses and chase you down. I mean, that's what it's like for most people in companies who realize the need for change. So I recruited, you remember that team? Remember that, that team that I talked to about the big printer and changing the printer? And so I started evolving to this team that you can do it, you can change it, because they said, we can't change the product, we can't, we can't. I go, you can, you will, you will. And I, and they, I, I go, and we've got to have some secret handshake, some secret kind of thing, so when we see each other in the hallway, you know that you did it. And remember that comment I made that I said, Remember I said it should look like fire is coming out of its ass, right? And, the, and I made these guys go back against everybody and make the change. And so whenever we'd see those people anywhere in the hallways of the company, they would go just like that. <laughs> just like that. So you got to have those fun things. You guys have been great. Thank you very much for having me. Enjoy yourself. We'll see you later. Thank, Thank you, Jeff. brother. Thank you.